man, I haven't seen this many people in a church on a Monday night in a long, long time. Man, this is incredible. This is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I'm humbled that, that we would carve out this much time and space for God's presence, for worship, for the word. And um, it's honestly a, a massive testament to the leadership of this house. And I know I've shouted out Pastor Jeff. And I, I, I mean, I, we got dinner last night. That was really fun. But man, being able to see a church that's this hungry for the word of God and this hungry for um, the presence of God means that it's not just something that can happen in a five days. It means that the church has been discipled this way. And man, don't you just love your pastors? Anybody? Come on. Love your pastors. Man. So honored to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, man, anybody ready for the word tonight? Anybody ready for the word tonight? Um, I am super excited. So I, I want to make um, a little bit of a, a housekeeping announcement. Um, I write devotional plans for every sermon, but I've been forgetting to announce these devotional plans. So um, was, was anybody in church all day yesterday, morning and night, morning and night? Okay, there are two devotional plans that you can get, all right? The first, ser the first three services uh, in the morning and afternoon, I preached a message called um, Calm Before the Storm. Sometimes I title it Calm in the Chaos. Depends on my mood. Um, but you can, you can text the word CALM, C-A-L-M, to 97000, and you'll receive a completely free five-day devotional plan written by me to help you move through that content. We did throw up a slide, but my admin team sent an old slide that said text the word STORMS to 97000. STORMS is the wrong word. So if you text the word STORMS, you, you wouldn't have received anything. But the right word is CALM, okay, CALM. Uh, at night, when, when I preach the walk back, you can text the word GREAT FAITH. No spaces in between GREAT or FAITH, just G-R-E-A-T. F-A-I-T-H. I just used a lot of brain power to spell that. <laughs> and you can receive a devotional plan on that message, okay? Um, and I, I will remember, Zach, you're going to wave at me at some point during the end of the message, and I'm going to give you a devotional plan for this sermon that I'm about to preach today. Um, now, over the next, is that good, anybody? Anybody already text the word calm? Did you text the word calm? Did it work? Let me know if it worked. Okay, awesome. Did anybody do great faith? Did that one work? It worked? Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm a pastor at heart. So I love preaching. I love traveling. But I love equipping God's people, okay? Because when, when I leave, uh, I want you to be able to, like, go through some devotional plans, especially if you're, if you're someone who's hungry for the Word. It's good. Preaching is awesome. But we want to equip you to study the Word of God for yourself. Come on. Give God the first hour of your day, the first 30 minutes of your day. And so that devotional plan, it's a PDF. It can download straight to your phone. And then you can use that to dig deeper into the, into the message and kind of go through the passages that I talked about from the stage, but kind of dig in deep for yourself. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go on a journey the next three nights. So tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday night, we're going to go on a journey. Uh, so the same way that yesterday was a two-part message. We talked about Jesus and storms and water and it's all in the same theme. Uh, for the next three nights, we're going to deal uh, with the people of Israel in the Old Testament. I figured if you've been, anybody been here all the way since Saturday night? Has any, all the, come on, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, and tonight? Perfect attendance? Come on, clap it up for yourself. That is phenomenal. So I want, it, I want it to stay in the New Testament for Saturday night, Sunday morning, and, and Sunday night. And for the next three nights, we're going to be in the Old Testament. And so we're, somebody likes the Old Testament. I heard a whoop. I heard a whoop. Somebody likes the Old Testament. I like the Old Testament. And so here we go. I want to kind of give you a map of where we're going. Tonight, we're really going to deal with the, the crossing of the Red Sea and the people getting into the wilderness. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about Jericho and the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. And then the last night, Wednesday night, 
we're going to talk about this sun stand still moment that Joshua has in Joshua chapter 10, I believe. And so we're going to kind of go on a journey, okay? So you're going to get to know the people of Israel pretty well. And you're going to get to know Moses and Joshua and all these characters. And so we're going to go on a journey. So if you've had perfect attendance, no reason to mess it up, okay? Because uh, all of these messages kind of flow with, with one another. So um, let's, let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Numbers, the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 11. If you're taking notes, um, I'm going to give you my sermon title in just a couple of minutes. Um, but man, hasn't the worship team been incredible? Man, the worship team's been incredible. And I have, I, I'm going to miss Iowa. It's, I, I really, I, well, because I'm not staying forever. <laughs> But, uh, but man, I've, this has been special. I know I've said it a couple of times, but I just want us to like really like, and, I, and sometimes I think when you're, when you're a part of a church, um, you can be a little desensitized to how awesome it is. This is a phenomenal church. This is an incredible church. Um, and, and yeah, just throughout the week, I've just been hearing people say, yeah, I've been here for 20 years, 25 years. I've been like, there's just deep roots in this church. And, and uh, I think especially for millennials, if you're in my generation, sometimes we struggle with being rooted and grounded. And uh, we're, we can float. We're very transient. And uh, I think that if you're a millennial and you've connected yourself to this covenant community, that's a special thing. And I would say, like, I would challenge us to stay planted in God's, God's house. Um, and I love this place. I feel like there's a generational anointing on this church. There's people here uh, from multiple generations. I, I absolutely, I, you're going to have a hard problem getting rid of me. So <laughs> I really like it here. So, um, man, and I was so much better in June. <laughs> it's so much better. It's, <laughs> I feel like you should name it something different in the winter. Like, it's just for branding purposes. Just name it something else. Um, <laughs> Just name it Frostbite, you know? And then when it's nice, just name it Iowa, you know? So, okay, here we go. <laughs> My ADHD, let's reel it in. Okay, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Uh, it says this in verse 4. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. It says, the rabble with them began to? Pray. Come on, all of us began to? Pray. Other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had Peace. to Peace. Okay, here we go, verse 5. We remember. We remember. We remember. We remember. We remember. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers. These, are, these people are foodies, okay? <laughs> okay, come on. The cucumbers, the the Please. onions and these people, they have a list. You hear them out in the wilderness, girl. We was eating good in Egypt, girl. Okay. Remember that fish we had? We had a fish fry, Pharaoh's fish fry. Oh, yeah, girl. It was popping, okay. Pharaoh's fish fry, they had cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. Mm. Them was the days. They're reminiscing about a season when they were slaves, but can only remember the pleasure of slavery, but not the cost associated with slavery. The biggest trick of the enemy is to get you to romanticize a past season. And remember how much fun it was, how much you enjoyed it, how incredible it was, but not remember that it cost you your peace and cost you your, your, your security and cost you your joy or cost you years of your life. Come on. What the devil loves to do is he loves to get us to remember the pleasure, but not the cost. You, think about what they said. That they're saying, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no Wait, um, guys, pause, wait a minute. The cost was your life. That was the cost. It cost your life. See, in the New Testament, Paul picks this theme up and he says, the wages of sin is death. 
There, there, there is no sin that's, there's no free sin, baby. Okay, I'll say it this way, and this is especially if you're a teenager in the room, if you're a millennial in the room, come on, some of the older saints in the room, they know this, but I want to teach this to all the millennials and, and the young adults in the room and the teenagers in the room. See, you start playing with sin and then sin starts playing with you. It's how sin works. It's how sin works. You start playing with it, but then after a while, sin puts puppet strings on you, and there's no such thing as free sin. It's no free sin. And see, can, can we go a little deeper with that thought? Can we go a little deeper? As, especially for people in my generation. That's why I'm getting a lot of amens from all the boomers and Gen X in the room. Come on. Because y'all are like, yeah, I played with some sin and sin started playing with me. But, but the next, our generation and the next generation needs to know this. Sin will advertise all of its pleasure. It'll advertise how fun it is. It'll advertise how amazing it is. But you know what sin never tells you? It's like, okay, you know what sin is like? Sin is like being at a restaurant. You ever been at one of these fancy restaurants with no prices next to the food? <laughs> I, I hate these places, okay? <laughs> like, I, there's times where I've taken my wife to like a fancy restaurant. We sit down and, you know, there's just, you know, soup of the day or fish market price. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> no, I want to know how much it costs. Can I tell you something? Sexual sin doesn't tell you how much it costs till it's over. And you're left counting the cost, counting the price. Addiction doesn't tell you how much it's going to cost you. And that's not just drug addiction. Come on, we live in an age where internet addiction and pornography addiction and their addiction, just period, it doesn't tell you how much it's going to cost you. In our curiosity, we start playing with sin, but after a while, sin just starts playing with, with us. Here we go. Okay, here we, let's, keep, let's keep reading. But now we have lost our... We never see anything but this, this manna. Now, okay, you may not know this, okay? You may not, you may not be aware of this. Um, God delivers the people from, from Egypt, okay? They go through the Red Sea. We're going to talk about that in a second. And, and now... They're, they're, they're out in the wilderness, and God is saying, I'm better than Pharaoh. Pharaoh fed you, I can feed you, and I'll feed you manna. So, so God puts them on his diet. Okay, manna falls from heaven every day. They wake up, and there's just bread on the floor. <laughs> every day. Every day. They don't have to grow anything. They don't have to put crops in the ground. Like, no seed, no harvesting, none of that. No fields, nothing. Just free food every day. And they don't like it. Yeah. We don't want this manna. We want fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. Manna? I'm tired of this manna. Here we go. It's my first point for taking notes. I haven't even given you my title, title yet, but I'm going to give you this first point. <laughs> your memories will keep you from your miracle. Your memories. Your memories. Your memories. Memories have a way of keeping us from miracles. This is why it's so imperative that we forgive people. You know, someone can be all about forgiving someone, and then they start remembering what actually happened that insulted them in the first place. And the memory of the hurt can keep you from the miracle of forgiveness. It's, it's almost like this. I, I, I'm wondering if there's anybody who, like, you've ever been in an argument with someone and then after the argument, you have all these comeback lines that you couldn't think of when you were in the actual conversation. <laughs> this happened to anybody else? <laughs> what I should have said, you know? That happens the same way just with normal unforgiveness. You start remembering and remembering. I can't believe they said that. And guess what? The more you remember and remember and remember, the more bitter you get, the more angry you get, the more resentment builds up. Can I tell you something? Your memory will keep you from the miracle of forgiveness. 
Memories will keep you from all types of miracles. Okay, let's, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. I think we've got a little bit more. Okay. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it, uh, ground it in a hand mill and crushed it in mortar. They cooked it in a pot and made it in loaves and it tasted something like, and it, and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. When the dew, when the dew settled on the camp, manna came down. Just miracle, just a straight miracle. Okay, here we go. If you're taking notes, you should have left the space for the title. Here's the title. Don't memorize the menu. Don't memorize the menu. Don't memorize the menu. Jesus, help me to preach this message. We've already prayed in song and said, pour your spirit out. And, and God, I'm reminded that you said, when the advocate comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll remind you of all the things that I've taught you. Holy Spirit, would you remind us of certain things today? And would you wipe other memories clean? We need help because some of us have memorized the menu. And I need your help to preach this the right way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This, is, this whole section of the Bible is one of my favorite sections, which is why I've given three days to preaching it, okay? Because this is one of my favorite sections of the Bible. I don't know if there's anybody like me, okay? I'm a millennial. I'm 33, but my parents were baby boomers. My parents weren't even Christians until I got into high school, but one of their favorite movies was The Ten Commandments by Charleston Heston. Anybody, anybody, come on, anybody, okay? Charleston Heston, the Ten Commandments. The movie was so long, it came on two VHS tapes. Where's Jay on? He doesn't know what a VHS tape is. <laughs> two VHS tapes, okay? Like, just a long movie. And, and, and for anybody, come on, the updated version, come on. Anybody, have, have you watched The Prince of Egypt recently? Come, okay, okay. This section of the Bible, Hollywood loves this section of the Bible. There's so many amazing things that happen in this section of the Bible. One of my favorite things is the fact that uh, Pharaoh, he lets the people of Israel go, remember this, and then Pharaoh, what? He changes his Mind. And he decides, no, I'm going to get my horses, I'm going to get my chariots, and I'm going to go retrieve these Israelites. And so they get to this predicament where, what, the Red Sea is in front of them and the armies of Egypt are behind them. And they're stuck. And I want to remind somebody today that God's back is never up against the wall. Come on. The enemy can never checkmate God. The enemy thinks he's got the people of Israel in a checkmate. But God, in a sheer moment of brilliance, begins to blow a wind. And it pushes back the Red Sea. And the people of Israel walk through on dry ground. It's one of the best scenes in the entire Bible. I love this. Pharaoh thinks, oh, I got him. I got him. And you know what the enemy always is trying to tell you? It's never going to get better. I've cornered you. I've got you. I've trapped you. But the enemy, when we begin to say, no, God is a deliverer. God can make a way. He can make a way out of no way. I believe in a God who can rescue you. Oh, come on. Sin starts playing with you. But how many people know that the blood of Jesus sets us free from bondage? It sets us free from guilt and shame. And I love this passage of scripture but 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 there's a part that has always confused me because the bible says they walk through on dry ground that didn't really make a lot of sense come on we don't need to be scientists here let's just think <laughs> if the sea rolls back they should have walked on mud right i mean just i'm just I'm just kind of reading this, you know? And I think to myself, how did they walk through on dry ground? How did they walk through on dry ground? Oh, I can tell you exactly how they walk through on dry ground. The reason they walk through on dry ground is the same reason that when I go to my mama's house, she makes me take my shoes off before I come inside so I don't track in the dirt from outside into the inside. See, the reason that they walk through on dry ground, God made the ground, the ground miraculously dry so they wouldn't track their past into their destiny. I wonder, is there anybody in the room right now who God has covered 
your tracks. At some point, people have looked at you and said, you don't even look like the dysfunction you came from. Why? Because God has covered your tracks. I wonder, is there anybody whose God has come through behind you? Me and Pastor Jeff were in the car yesterday. And I'm saying, Pastor, you wouldn't imagine my family. My mom was pregnant at the age of 12. My dad was in prison for 18 years. When I got to church, there was so much dysfunctional thinking. I don't know. It was discipleship or my pastors or this or that. And Pastor Jeff said these words, or it was the Holy Ghost. And I was like, Pastor Jeff, you preaching. That's right. It was the Holy Ghost because the Holy Spirit has a way of covering your tracks. Maybe you come from a perfect background. You are dismissed. But for all of the people who there are some things that you want, Walk through and God began to say, I'm not going to let you track that into your future. I'm going to let you give God a good amen right there. Oh God, we praise you that we don't look like what we've been through. That you've rescued us and delivered us. They come through what? On dry ground. On dry ground. So they don't bring their past season into their next season. You know what I'm praying for you? That there would be a dry ground season in your life. That God would miraculously begin to cover some tracks in your life. I've got a friend, his name is CB, and every time he tells his testimony, I get, I get emotional because CB, he's a pastor now in Denver, Colorado. He's an amazing man of God. I love CB, he's a great friend. But CB was addicted to meth for years, and every time he tells his testimony, he just opens up his mouth and says, I still have my teeth. I don't even know how I still have teeth. You know why? Because God covers tracks. God covers tracks. You don't always look like what you've been through because God covers tracks. Oh, I need somebody to give God an amen. He covers your tracks. Here we go. I'm going to challenge us. God can cover your tracks, but only you can change your taste buds. Ooh. Oh, come on. We can praise him that he covers tracks. But he can deliver you from Egypt. Take the chains off your wrist. Take the chains off your ankles. But if Pharaoh still has a leash on your tongue, then you will always be a citizen of Egypt because you will always begin to say things like, well, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt. We remember the onions, the leeks, the melons, the, do you hear this list? Details of what they ate and how they liked it. See, taste, taste, taste. See, God can free your feet and free your hands, but if the enemy still has your tongue, okay, I'll say it this way. I'll say it this way. I need to say it a different way. It's okay. Zach, you're going to help me preach this. We're going to do this. Okay, here we go. You can be as strong as Samson, anointed to kill Philistines, but if you have an appetite for Philistine women, your appetite, your appetite, what you have a taste for. See, me and my wife, we, we used to love this restaurant. It was one of our favorite restaurants in Raleigh. And, you know, I, I'm the kind of person, I don't know if you're like me, uh, my wife, every time she goes to a, 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 the same restaurant, we go to the same restaurant, she orders something different. I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't understand that. that I don't understand. I'm, I'm just think, I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, you're not loyal. You're not loyal. You lack consistency. You lack character. I don't, I, why would you do this? Like, this is just an unnecessary risk. For what, for what reason? Uh, so like, if I, if I go to a restaurant, it's not because I have a taste for that restaurant. It's because I have a taste for the dish at that restaurant. Anybody like me? Come on. Who's like my wife? Who's like my wife? Who's like my wife? Okay. Y'all are crazy. Who's like me? Who's like me? Okay. All the normal people. Awesome. Great. I'm just joking. <laughs> and so I remember going to a restaurant one time. And of course, it's one of our favorite restaurants. I don't even need a, I don't even need a menu. What do I need a menu for? I know exactly what I came here to get. So the waitress comes and asks me for my order, and I give the waitress my order. And the waitress alerted me that the restaurant is under new management. 
and, and I'm thinking, why did you go and do that? <laughs> and then I said, your management ain't got nothing to do with me. That ain't none of my business. I don't, I don't need to know about your management. I'm just concerned with your menu. <laughs> and then she said this, well, sir, the management controls the menu. You know what a lot of us want? We want God's management, a Pharaoh's menu. You want God's blessings, you want God's presence, you want God's spirit, but you want to order a little gossip off the menu, uh-oh, uh-oh. Order a little bit of unforgiveness off the menu when you've got a taste for it, hello. Not in Iowa, but back in North Carolina, you know, order a little cuss you out off the menu. <laughs> Come on. God's management comes with a new menu. Now here's the problem. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to make this plain. Here we go. What you've tasted previously has a dramatic effect on whether you're gonna like God's meal today. Okay, okay. Um, what's your name? My name's Reese. Reese. Do you like orange juice? Yes, I do. Of course you do. You're normal. <laughs> Reese, I love orange juice. Sweet. Okay? In order to keep up with my love for orange juice, Luke, my wife has to buy it from Costco. Okay? I pour like two to three full glasses of orange juice every morning. I love this stuff. Anybody with me? Anyone just realize orange juice? Oh, not a lot of orange juice lovers in Iowa. Okay, okay, orange juice, it's amazing. It's awesome. I would contend orange juice is delicious. The right combination of acidity and sweet, it's great. And to me, you know, pulp, no pulp, I don't care. As long as it's orange and it's juice, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. But Reese, um, you like orange juice. Have you ever made the mistake of brushing your teeth? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Before you drank orange juice? If you brush your teeth before you drink orange juice, something that is delicious turns disgusting, not because the orange juice is different, but because of what you tasted before you put the orange juice in your mouth. Ooh. See, Egypt's menu has a way of altering your palate so that when you start tasting manna, you complain about the manna because you got a taste for what the world has been offering. And, and we can't talk about the Holy Spirit without talking about holiness. We, you know, we don't get the Holy Spirit without a consecrated church. This is why this is special. That's why you being here on a Monday night is special. Because what you're saying is, I'm going to give God consecrated time. I'll sacrifice time and I'll consecrate this to the Lord. Not at this church. Not here. But back in North Carolina. <laughs> I'll have people walk into my office and begin to complain about the manna that God's given them in their life. And I begin to tell men, women, especially in marriage. <laughs> there's, there's been some young adult women at our church who complain to me like, Pastor Manny, I don't know about this Christian dude I'm dating. He's boring. And I'm like, boo-boo. <laughs> boring? Did you just say boring? Yeah, he boring. And, and I'm like, okay, how's he boring? You know, he's just so responsible and he's like a square and he's like, follows the rules and he just, and, I, and I'm like, boo-boo, listen. <laughs> listen to me, that's not boring, that's normal. And the problem is you've tasted so much dysfunctional that now your palate doesn't know the difference between dysfunction and normality. Can we do this? Uh-oh, I'm gonna get canceled. How about we normalize normal? Just, since we're normalizing everything in our culture, how about we just normalize normal? Normal. 
let's bring normal back. Just normal. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just normal. Just, just, because you know what? In our culture, normal is now weird. So if you were looking to be edgy, just go ahead and be normal. Because our culture doesn't know left from right, up from down, right from wrong. We're just confused. This dude is boring. Boo-boo, he ain't boring. <laughs> He's normal. It's normal. You wouldn't imagine how many men I counsel who complain about their sex life with their wife because they experience so much frat life craziness that they have now brought ridiculous expectations into a relationship with a normal woman. Now, here's, here's what I wanna teach you. All right, you ready? I got like two minutes. Okay. A couple chapters after this, Numbers chapter 11, a couple chapters later, you wanna know what Moses does? He sends spies out into the land of Canaan to see what the fruit of the land is. And they come back with grapes, pomegranates, and the land is flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey. Now, I need you to see this because they had fish, melons, cucumbers, leeks, onions, and Egypt. They were about to get grapes, pomegranates, milk, honey, and Canaan. But they had to get tested with manna first. Can I tell you something? Manna's not permanent. But if you don't put manna in between grapes, milk, honey, and pomegranates on this side, and fish, melons, leeks, you'll never have an opportunity to cleanse your palate. See, Pentecostal doctrine, holiness doctrine says this, that things don't have to be sin for me to abstain from them. Oh, come on. It doesn't have to be sin for me to say no to it. The opposite of sin, the opposite of sin in the Bible isn't not sin. <laughs> no. The opposite of sin is holy. Holy. And what does it mean to live a holy life? It means to say, uh, hey, I'm not, I'm not saying alcohol is sin. Drunkenness definitely is. But you know what? I'm just going to put that on the altar of sacrifice. Because I want something more. I don't have to be, in millennials, we need this. Because millennials just want, we, we, we're just like, I mean, but is it sin now? And I want to say back, but is it wise though? <laughs> Who's, wh why are we so enamored with whether or not it's sin? You want to know another word for, for the, the contrary to holy? It's common. 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 In the tabernacle, there were certain things that were holy, which meant you couldn't use it at your house. <laughs> Plates, bowls, dishes, they were holy. You see, God isn't saying, no, that's sinful. He's just saying it's very common. And if I'm going to use you for an uncommon purpose, then I'm going to have to sanctify you and consecrate you. And I'm going to have to require another level of sacrifice from you that isn't normal, that isn't what everybody else is used to. If I've got a history of fish, melons, cucumbers, leeks, onions, garlic, you know, God may put me through a couple years of manna so that I can actually enjoy the grapes, enjoy the pomegranates, enjoy the milk, enjoy the honey. I'm telling you right now, the wisest thing you can do is to embrace a holy lifestyle. A holy lifestyle. You say, you know what? I just can't go there. Like, I, yo, y'all may be able to go to the club. I can't. Not because that's sinful. Not because I'm going to do something wrong. But because my reputation's at stake. Because God is, God's consecrated me. I, I just, I can't do that. 
Listen, listen. This is, I feel like there's a lot of millennials over here. So every time I say millennials, I like come walking over here. Listen to me. That's not legalistic. That's not legalism. That's called discipline. Okay? It's not legalism. It's just wisdom and discipline. And, and I, I get it. There's some churches that I've been to that are pretty legalistic. Yeah. But you know what? I'd rather be strict and then have to loosen up a little bit than have no standards and then have to learn all this discipline sometime later. It's okay. It's okay. It says we remember. We remember. We remember. We remember. The leeks, onions, garlic, fish. <sighs> Zach, you want to know what I wish they'd remembered? Since they wanted to remember so bad. You want to know what I wish they remembered? I, want, I wish that they had remembered that one day we were standing on the Nile and it turned to blood because God was finally judging the idols of Egypt. I wish they had thought to themselves around the campfire, we remember hailstones dropping out of the sky. We remember frogs coming up out of the Nile. We remember locusts eating up all of the Egyptian crops. You want to know what we remember? We remember the fact that God remembered us in our slavery and in our groaning and he heard our cry after hundreds of years. I wish to God that they had remembered that there was a death angel that passed through the land but because they had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their homes while there was rejoicing in Goshen there was weeping and wailing throughout the land of Egypt I wish they had remembered that Pharaoh's firstborn son died I wish they had remembered that the sea opened up as a highway and they walked through on dry ground I wish they had remembered if you're gonna remember if you're gonna start reminiscing don't think about the fish and the onions and the leeks and the garlic how about you remember that God delivered me and saved me and rescued me how about you start remembering that when you didn't see a way out of the abusive relationship God came through and delivered you when you couldn't see a way out of the addiction God with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm he saved your life why would you remember the wrong thing since we want to play the memory game why can't we remember that God rescued you from that relationship? Here we go. At no cost, remember? Do you remember? Come on. They remembered the food that they ate, what, at no cost. You want to know what we do? We remember the pleasures of sin, but not the cost of sin. But then you want to know what we do in church? We want to complain about the cost of holiness. Oh, come on. I remember my dad was a drug addict his whole life. Started coming to church and you want to know what he complained about? Tithing. And I remember sitting down with my father and said, you've wasted a fortune on drugs. And you want to complain about tithing? Tithing? Satan took 100% of your money. And now God is only asking for 10. And you want to complain about tithing? You spent more at the club than you'll ever spend in church. What do you mean? All the money you spent on alcohol and weed and drugs. What do you mean? You just have an expectation that this comes with no cost? Really? You have no problems with the enemy charging your life but you want to complain that a pastor would take up an offering what salvation is free but it's gonna cost you your life it's free it's a free gift from God but it's gonna cost you it's gonna cost you that's not legalism legalism is this Legalism is if I can pay for it first, then get salvation. 
Legalism has to do with the ordering. God says, this is grace. I rescue you first, then you do good works. Legalism says, I'll do good works, then God will rescue me. Our millennial culture has said, all good works is legalism. That is not true. Works is not legalism. Works to gain salvation is legalism. Grace says, I set you free, now I own your life. And salvation is a free gift. God can set you free in an instant, in a moment. Come to the altar, we'll pray. You are free, you are a new creation in Christ, and now you're just gonna live the rest of your life in service back to him. Legalism is about the order, the order. Grace first, then works. I was in school all day, so I'm being a little nerdy with you. It's okay. Here we go. This is my prayer tonight. You're in the room. And you're saying, Pastor Manny, my palate's got to change. My palate's got to change. I've got a taste for some stuff. You know what? And, and I feel like the Holy Spirit's been asking for it, asking me to sacrifice that. And I've been playing this game with God. Maybe it's tithing. Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's financial. Maybe, maybe it's just gossip. Maybe it's a friend group. May, may, I don't know what it is. I don't know what you have a taste for. But there's something. You developed a taste for it. And God is saying, could you, could you put that on the altar? Could you start... Could, you, could I start you on this menu of manna? Cleanse your palate so that you can actually walk into the fullness of Canaan. I promise. If that's you tonight, just raise your hand at me. I want to pray for you. Come on. I've got a taste for something. Got a taste for something. Man. And maybe, maybe you developed it during COVID. Come on. It's a hard year. 2020 is a difficult year. Maybe you got a taste for worry taste for gossiping, a taste for complaining, a taste for fear. And you don't know how to wean yourself off. It's funny. I was at a really fancy restaurant with my wife, and uh, the food was incredible. I said to the chef, I said to the waitress, give my compliments to the chef. This was one of the best meals I've ever had. A couple minutes went by, and the waitress came out with free dessert on the house. You know what's funny? Praise is the thing that switches the menu. When I get, when I start praising him for the manna, he goes, oh, you're ready for the milk and the honey. God, start praising you for the manna that I'm walking in right now. God, thank you, thank you. Thank you that I'm not eating meat around with slaves. I'm not a slave. God, thank you, thank you. Thank you, I'm gonna fix my memory. I'm not going to remember how good it tastes. No, I'm going to remember the cost it costs you to get me out of that. And I'm going to praise you. And I promise you, praise will fix your palate. Praise begins to fix your palate. There is nothing like gratitude when you say, God, thank you. Thank you for the struggle. Thank you for the negative doctor support. Thank you. I'm just glad I'm alive. God, if you don't do another thing for me, you did enough for me on Calvary. You did enough for me already. God, I love you. God, I thank you. And when you begin to be grateful for manna, oh my God, it's almost like he begins to turn the menu. God begins to do that. That is what God does. He's the one that can turn the menu, not just a season. No, God begins to say, you've learned the lesson. And we begin to say to the Lord, God, I thank you. This isn't what I want, but I thank you for it. It's making me better. If, man, I feel the Holy Spirit. That's you. You're saying, I've been complaining about something I need to start thanking God for. Just lift up your hand. I want to know what I'm praying for. I've been complaining about things. I've been complaining about things. I've got to change what's coming out of my mouth. I've been complaining. I've been complaining. God, we repent right now. Come on, with our hands lifted. God, we repent. We repent. We repent. God, we're sorry. We're sorry. 
We're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. And we know that revival starts with repentance. It starts with repentance. So God, with a repentant heart, there's no spirit of condemnation in this room, just conviction. It's Holy Spirit conviction. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would change our palate. That if there's a taste for things that we've developed, that you would begin to take that out of our mouth. Out of our mouth. Out of our mouth. God, supernaturally, Holy Spirit, I ask for a supernatural removal of a taste for something that is leading us to death and not life. Holy Spirit, I ask that as we humbly come before you, that God, that you would turn our palates around. And as we offer you praise, that we'd be reminded that manna doesn't last forever. You've got milk and honey and grapes and pomegranates set aside for us. This may just be me. This may be the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I feel like just let to pray for someone who you're not sure about your relationship with God right now. You come to church, and in the church I grew up in, we'd call it a backslidden state. Like you, you've been going through the motions and you don't know if you're a Christian. Like maybe you've just developed some sinful habits that have taken you out of God's will. And I, I feel like the Lord is saying, do an altar call for salvation. I know a lot of us in here are Christians. And maybe you know I'm talking to you. Maybe there's just been a season of your life where Maybe you're a Christian in name only, but you're not, you don't have an assurance of your salvation. You really don't know. You don't know. And you've just become lukewarm, backslidden. Maybe you were walking with God for a long time and then maybe you got into some romantic relationship, moved in with someone and your life has just been a whirlwind of confusion and you want to rededicate your life to God tonight. Rededicate your life to God tonight with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. If that's you, can you just lift up your hand? I want to pray for you. You want to rededicate your life to God tonight. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Keep your hand lifted. I want to know who I'm praying for. Keep your hand lifted. I want to know who I'm praying for. I see your hand. I see your hand. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. You don't need to feel embarrassed. Christians are praying all around the room. Christians are praying around the room. If that's you, I'm going to give you a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds. Just throw up your hand. You want to rededicate your life to God tonight. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. You want to rededicate your life to God tonight. I see your hand. Man, the hand's going up all over the room. I want everybody to pray this prayer. We don't want to single anybody out. I want everybody to pray this prayer. Can we all say this together? Repeat after me. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for dying. In my place. Thank you. For living. The life. I. Could never live. And dying. A death, I wouldn't want to die. I confess with my mouth that you are Savior and Lord. And I, from this day forward, am a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new is here. I Believe in my heart that you are king, that you are Lord, that you rose from the grave, that you ascended in the heaven, and that you're coming back to judge the living 
and the dead. I give you my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, church, there's a whole bunch of us. We've rededicated our lives to God. We've rededicated our lives to the Lord. Friend, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy for you. So happy for you. And God, I pray for everybody else who raised their hand at any other invitation for you to cleanse our palates, for us to walk in holiness. God, I ask that you would seal everything that we said tonight. Holy Spirit, we need you. God, keep this atmosphere charged. Oh, we declare tomorrow night, Wednesday night, God, you're going to continue to meet us here. God, I thank you for every single person in the pews, in the rows. God, I ask that if they've had a taste for alcohol or gossip or whatever, that, Lord, you would begin to take it out of their mouth. You're coming back for a spotless bride, a spotless bride. So God, we'll preach about holiness, even though it's not popular, because you're coming back for a spotless bride. Make us holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.